Good afternoon, everyone. First off, I have a travel announcement for you. We, ha we had announced earlier that starting this weekend, the Secretary General will travel first to Vienna and then to Brussels. Uh, I can inform you that following those stops, the Secretary General will be in Washington, D.C. starting on Thursday, the 17th of May. He will have meetings on Capitol Hill with members of Congress and key officials in the U.S. administration. And on Saturday, the 19th of May, the Secretary General will deliver the commencement address at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He will return to New York following that event. Our colleagues at the World Health Organization said today they have estimated figures showing a total of 32 Ebola cases in the Democratic Republic of the Congo for the period between the 4th of April and the 9th of May 2018. WHO and Médecins Sans Frontières already have a response team on the ground, and a second team is being set up with between 20 and 40 specialists in epidemiology, logistics, social mobilization, contact tracing, and vaccination programs. Personal protective equipment has been deployed, and we hope that mobile laboratory facilities will be functioning by the weekend. Access to the area is extremely problematic, as it is 15 hours by motorcycle from the closest town. WHO is discussing with the World Food Program the possibility of clearing the runway in Bikoro and setting up an air bridge. The outbreak is of particular concern, as it has already been identified in three locations over a range of 60 kilometers. Furthermore, three health workers are already known to have been infected, one of them having died yesterday. WHO is therefore planning for all scenarios, including the worst case scenario. It has released $1 million from its contingency fund on the day the outbreak has been declared. And Emergency Relief Coordinator Mark Lowcock has announced an Im immediate $2 million allocation from the Central Emergency Response Fund to help humanitarian partners in the DRC fight and contain this new outbreak of Ebola. On South Sudan, three senior UN officials today strongly condemned the recent escalation of violence in former unity state and urged all parties to end the attacks against civilians, especially women and children. In the last two weeks, reports from the former unity state indicate intense fighting between government forces, the Sudan People's Liberation Army, and the SPLA in opposition. Preliminary investigations by the United Nations have uncovered alarming patterns of serious human rights violations and abuses, including killings, pillaging, abductions, rape, and gang rape committed by both parties during the fighting, leading to forced displacement of the population. The Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflict, Pramila Patton, the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children in Armed Conflict, Virginia Gamba, and the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, Adama Jang, said these violations could con constitute atrocity crimes. They added that sexual violence as a widespread and systematic tactic of war continues in South Sudan, reportedly to punish civilians who are perceived to be associated with a particular political or ethnic group. There are more details in a joint communique available online. And the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, will travel to Sudan and South Sudan from the 12th to the 16th of May to see firsthand the protracted humanitarian situation in Sudan and the devastating consequences of ongoing violence in South Sudan. While in Sudan from the 12th to the 14th of May, Mr. Lowcock will meet people displaced by conflict in South Kordofan and engage with senior government officials and humanitarian partners in Khartoum. Sudan is one of the world's largest protracted emergencies with at least 5.5 million people in need of assistance. The humanitarian community has appealed for $1 billion to provide humanitarian assistance to those in need in 2018, of which $229 million has been received. In South Sudan, from the 15th to the 16th of May, Mr. Lokok will witness the current humanitarian situation there and call for urgent action to alleviate suffering. The crisis in South Sudan continues to grow in severity, scale, and scope. 7.1 million people at risk of becoming severely food insecure in the coming months. South Sudan's humanitarian response plan is currently just 14% funded, leaving a gap of nearly $1.5 billion. In Afghanistan, the UN Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, Andrew Gilmore, has welcomed the commitment by the government to improve the human rights situation, but he also urged more action to end attacks on civilians, mainly by extremists, and the continued discrimination against Afghan women at all levels of society. What would send a strong signal to men who continue to violently abuse women with impunity would be to start seriously prosecuting them, Mr. Gilmore has said. He also urged the authorities to investigate and prosecute military or civilian perpetrators of sexual abuse of boys. 
And in his meeting with President Ashraf Ghani on Wednesday, Mr. Gilmore welcomed the President's clear commitment to take additional measures to protect civilians, despite extremely difficult circumstances. More details on his visit can be found on the UN Missions website. Nikolai Mladenov, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, met in Moscow today with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, and he warned that the United Nations is very concerned that there is a conflagration of conflicts currently in the Middle East that are raising tensions on all levels, including the situation in Syria, the situation in Yemen, and the Palestinian track. He said he was particularly worried about the US Embassy move to Jerusalem on Monday and the planned protests in Gaza. He once more called on Israel to be very careful and calibrated in how it uses force in addressing the protesters in Gaza. And he also called on Hamas and the leaders of the protests in Gaza to prevent friction and to prevent situations in which provocations can happen. His remarks are online. Yesterday, two groups of people reportedly reached the al Madik castle crossing point after being evacuated from northern rural Homs to the northwestern parts of Syria. One of the two groups was reportedly denied entrance to Al-Bab city and forced to return to the crossing point after waiting for 37 hours. The total number of people evacuated from northern rural homes was 6,194 as of yesterday. The freedom of movement of civilians must be ensured by all parties to the ground. On the ground, any evacuation of civilians must be safe, voluntary, and in strict accordance with pr protection standards under international law. The United Nations continues to call on all parties and those with influence over them to ensure the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure and to allow safe, sustained, and unimpeded humanitarian access to all in need in line with their obligations under international humanitarian law. It is also imperative that all those as displaced are allowed to return voluntarily in safety and in dignity to their homes as soon as the situation allows it. In a statement we issued yesterday afternoon, the Secretary General congratulated Malaysia on the peaceful holding of national and state legislative elections and commended the people of Malaysia for their strong commitment to the democratic process. The Secretary General welcomed the announcement of the formation of a new government under the leadership of Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad, and he paid tribute to outgoing Prime Minister Najib Razak. The Secretary General looks forward to further working closely with Malaysia on issues of mutual interest. We also issued a statement in which the Secretary General welcomed the trilateral summit held between Japan, China, and the Republic of Korea on the 9th of May in Tokyo, the support of the leaders of the three countries to the Panmunjom Declaration, and their cooperation for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The Secretary General hopes that the joint resolve of the countries in Northeast Asia will strengthen the path to achieve lasting peace and prosperity in the region. Since the onset of the rainy season in East Africa, consistent and heavy rains have caused flash and river flooding in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. Flooding has resulted in the displacement of 151,000 people in the Somali region of Ethiopia and 311,100 people in Kenya. In Somalia, flooding has affected 718,000 people, including the displacement of 220,000 people in the southern and central regions of the country. Respective governments and humanitarian partners are providing assistance, but the delivery of aid is being impeded by resource constraints. In Ethiopia, urgent interventions are required to prevent the re-emergence of acute watery diarrhea outbreaks in the Somali region. The Kenya Red Cross Society has reported an urgent need to replenish non-food stocks, and $23.8 million are critically required for assistance in Somalia. I want to flag that tomorrow is World Migratory Bird Day, which aims to raise awareness of the importance of protecting migratory birds and their habitats all around the world. The Secretary General says that migratory birds connect people, ecosystems, and nations, and are symbols of peace and of an interconnected planet. He asks that the day is a reminder that ecosystems worldwide are threatened by climate change and urged governments and people everywhere to take concerted, concerted conservation action that will help to ensure the bird's survival and our own. And today we are pleased to thank our friends in Cote d'Ivoire, Mauritania, and the United Kingdom. The three member states have paid their regular budget dues in full. This takes the honor roll to 93. And we'll have, after I'm done, Brendan Verma, the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly. And then as soon as we finish, we'll be joined by Jordan, Gordon Brown, the UN Special Envoy for Global Education, who's meeting right now with the Secretary General and receiving a petition from youth advocates calling for more investment on education. We'll also be joined by Annette Dixon, the World Bank's Vice President of Human Development, Luis Albert, Albert, Alberto Moreno, President of the Inter-American Development Bank, and Jakai Kakwete, former President of Tanzania and Commissioner with the International Commission on Financing Global Education Opportunity. Uh, anything for me before we get to Brendan? Yes, Masood. Thank you. 
Mr. Bond, thank you for on. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, two questions. In the in the in that in in Middle East, the situation is that it seems that uh, there's going to be a war any time, and the nuclear war and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the IAEA has been responsible for all the nuclear, what you call, uh, weapons being carried by other people. I know that I, Israel has not allowed any access to IAEA or anybody else, but does United Nations know how much of an arsenal, nuclear arsenal, does Israel have? The last count it was 200. Is more than that? What's the situation? Well, we have, uh, of course, called for all uh, countries, all uh, member states, uh, to abide by, to sign and abide by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And, of course, we continue to do that. But uh, you're quite right that the International Atomic Energy Agency does not have access uh, uh, to Israel. Uh, it, uh, it did mention earlier this week, by the way, that, uh, that it continues its activities in Iran. Yes, on, on the same thing, on the same thing, the, uh, Russia has uh, said that uh, the United States were drawing from the, uh, I mean, reneging from the deal, Iran deal, is a violation of the Security Council resolution. Does the Secretary General also believe it's a violation of the Security Council resolution? Well, uh, you've seen uh, what we have said about this, and we stay and stand by what the Secretary General has said. Regarding questions of Security Council resolutions, I would refer you to the text of Resolution 2231, but it's up to the members of the Council to determine uh, uh, if resolutions are, are not being implemented, and if so, what to do about it. Yes. Farhan, I had a couple of questions regarding Stefan's response to calls from civil society for Michelle Sadebe, the head of UNAIDS, to step down over his handling of uh, sexual harassment claims. Uh, Steph said that the Secretary General uh, feels Michelle Sadebe has done a good job at UNAIDS, especially on issues of gender, and fully supports him. Why did the Secretary General decide to express his full support, given the serious allegations that Mr. Sadebe is facing, and given the fact that the uh, investigation has been reopened? Well, uh, we have taken the decision uh, to reopen the investigation. As you know, the Office of Internal Oversight Services is now looking into the matter. Uh, obviously, we would uh, we'll go by whatever their conclusions are once they have gone about their work. Uh, regarding Mr. Sidibe's leadership of, of UNAIDS, the position is uh, as Stefan has expressed it and continues to be the case. So could I ask then, does the Secretary General also fully support Martina Brostrom, who has accused Mr. Sidibe of a cover-up? We uh, want to help all the sides of this case get to the bottom of this, which is why uh, the decision was taken to reopen this. Uh, it was felt that the previous investigation uh, needed uh, ultimately to, to have a, a proper follow-up, and that's what we're doing. But you do agree that there are claims against Mr. Sidibe, so for the Secretary General to come out and fully support him, given the allegations against him, seems odd to people sitting on this side of the room. I mean, do you know something that we don't? The, this is a, a support for, for Mr. Sidibe and, and his work at UNAIDS. I can't speculate uh, or, or prejudge what the Office of Internal Oversight Services will say as they look into the Luris case. Uh, they are free to do so, and then we will evaluate that accordingly once they've done that. Same topic. Uh, hold on. You, please. Uh, thanks. Do you have any information about Amina's visit in Cuba? Uh, yeah, I believe we had... Um, uh, uh, pointed out that the Deputy Secretary General is visiting Cuba, so s we have the uh, announcement that went out uh, yesterday. Beyond that, there's nothing uh, further to share today. Yes. Sure. Beyond the, the reopening and, and whatever, you know, OIOS has invested reinvestigation of the Luris case, there was the widely reported speech by Mr. Sidibe to staff saying, Mr. Luris is a great man, and those of you who come out against him uh, will be investigated. This was reported in The Guardian with direct quotes. And I guess that, I think, I wanted to ask you, totally outside, is OIOS looking at threats of retaliation attributed to Mr. Sidibe by many participants in that meeting in an article published in The Guardian? And what is Mr. Guterres as the head of the system? Does he believe that that was a, 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 a speech that's consistent with the non-retaliation principles that he espouses? Well, it's, it's up to OIOS to determine. The Office of Internal Oversight Services determines what they'll look into. So I'll, I'll leave it that matter in their hands. Regarding uh, uh, the ability of people to speak out, obviously the Secretary General believes that all 
staff of all UN bodies have the, the right to speak out if they feel that, uh, that there has been any sort of wrongdoing and that they shouldn't feel silenced or impeded in any way. But if the Secretary General is sort of, if you've just said that, you know, he'll, he's obviously will defer to the OIS's findings, does he understand what the scope of the review is? Is the review of the, of the, the abuse alleged by Mr. Louris or is it of a speech after Mr. Louris was cleared by Mr. Sidibe to staff? Uh, ultimately, like I said, it's, it's up to uh, the Office of Internal Oversight Services itself to determine what avenues it wishes to pursue. We'll, we'll provide information about the investigation once it's, uh, once it's completed. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Evelyn hasn't had a chance, and then you can go. Uh, no, Ev Evelyn first. Sorry, to keep belaboring UN AIDS. Um, the entire case, the, the, does the Secretary General know this is as political as it is legal? And is he aware of what happened when Mr. Annan uh, defended Mr. Lovers and Mark Mallet Brown had to come out and change it? Because right now, it's damaging the UN reputation and saying there's another investigation, there's always another investigation. The man, to clear him would be difficult. It's not just one woman. It's just one woman now knows how to hit the media. Well, the Secretary General is very well versed in the history of the Rude Lubbers case. As you'll recall, he was the High Commissioner of Refugees who replaced Mr. Lubbers. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for an on this situation in Gaza and West Bank, that one person was killed today when after the Friday prayers, and there was uh, more than that, and Israel has been, uh, what do you call it, killing people in the Gaza, especially around Friday, as a ritual. Does the Secretary General have anything to say as to what is happening, and has he talked to anybody in Israel about the use of extreme force against these people? Well, uh, you heard what I had to say at the start of this briefing about uh, the remarks by Mr. Mladenov that he made in Moscow. Beyond that, of course, we, we reiterate the calls we've been making for all sides to exercise restraint and to refrain from violent actions, incitement, or provocations that may lead to an escalation of the situation. It's imperative that children should not be put in harm's way during these events. We also reiterate calls for measured response by security forces, proportionate to threat and ensuring protection of civilians. Just yes. a clar clarification on OIOS. You're saying they have free reign to follow what, whatever avenue they, f they think is appropriate. So it would include the original investigation, which, was, which doubts have been uh, cast over, and the reaction of the, execu of the uh, executive director. Am I understanding you correctly? I, I'm, I'm not speculating what exactly they're looking into at this point. That, that is their purview. Should we the, not they, know they what they're report. looking into, Farhan? They, they I mean, will... What are they investigating? Uh, we, when we made the announcement, uh, we had mentioned that they were that the Lurus case was being reopened, and the, uh, the Office of Internal Oversight Services was looking into it. We will provide details once they have completed their work. Why not before? Well, because we don't we don't provide updates on investigations as they proceed. We wait for their, them to be completed. But surely we, you do provide a mandate or a scope of ref, uh, you know a reference to what they are looking at. Seems strange that you won't provide yeah, that now. The, the, what I what I say what I'm saying is I don't want to speculate into what avenues they will look at. Uh, it will become clear once they've completed their work. Yes. Sure. I, I guess it's just a request to have Heidi Mendoza. I don't think has done a press conference since she's been head of OIOS, and previous heads of OIOS have done it. So could you consider this a request that she, both on this issue and generally on the work of OIOS, have okay, a press okay. conference? I mean, I, I know that uh, from from past experiences with past heads of OIOS that they tend not to comment on ongoing cases. But yes, we can pay, make a request for want, her to, to do a briefing. I want to ask you about Cote d'Ivoire. The, the, the Malian president is in uh, Abidjan, and it's reported that, that uh, Cote d'Ivoire is going to give 400 uh, peacekeeping troops to, to MINUSMA in Mali. And I know that when, when the Secretary General met with the foreign minister here, it was said that by him at the stakeout, by the foreign minister, that they intend to give 450 troops in Central African Republic. Are, are these both true? Or is, is Cote d'Ivoire going to be produce, providing four, 850 peacekeeping troops to two missions and in, 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 what, in what time frame? Well, ultimately, uh, it's, it's, you know, we don't, um, uh, we confer first with member states about what kind of um, contributions that they'll make. Uh, 
obviously at this stage we, we don't have a, a, a firm announcement to make about these contributions. But, uh, but what we try to do is, is work out with different member states where the contributions could best be used. But he seemed, the foreign minister standing at the stakeout, uh, the UN Security Council stakeout on UN TV said 450 to CAR. So it seemed like he, on their side they make that commitment. Yeah, but uh, but that is something that remains to be discussed uh, with uh, peacekeeping to see where best, uh, how, where best and how best we can use troops. Yes. Uh, regarding the Secretary General's uh, visit next week to Washington D.C., obviously he's going to be addressing academia and uh, George, George, uh, Georgetown University students and meeting lawmakers on Capitol Hill. So what's what's the message he's he's, he's going to be bringing to town there? Is he going to plead for something over there? Well, as, as you know, whenever the Secretary General uh, travels to Washington, he tries to encourage support for uh, our issues of mutual concern uh, from uh, our, uh, our friends in the U.S. government. And uh, he'll do that at this point. And, uh, and we'll uh, try to share his uh, commencement message when we can do that. But uh, as you know, uh, he's been warning uh, in his different speeches, uh, including to students, about the, the problems that the world faces and the need for a collective response uh, to deal with them. Yes, you and then you. Sure. I wanted to ask, yesterday I'd asked Stefan about the, the, um, the compacts and also the, the public financial disclosure on the Secretary General's website. And he said he would look into why both, uh, just as an example, Under Secretary General Lacroix and Smale, uh, don't, there's, there's no, they're not included on the list. Uh, do you have an answer on that? Uh, no, no, I don't. But the the general point is that uh, there is an option, a voluntary option, to uh, to have your disclosure put on the website. We encourage openness about, among uh, the the senior officials to do that. But for a variety of reasons, they they may find it best not to do that. The fact that their names are not on the website does not mean that they have not made the disclosures. Everyone who's a senior official has made their disclosures to our firms. Right, but does it mean that they've chosen to, to opt out of the public financial disclosure? Either that or it hasn't been uploaded right. so far. And I wanted to ask about the compact. I'm sorry, I think this is on the same topic. Yesterday, Stefan said these compacts are, are representative of transparency, et cetera. So I wanted to know, I've seen some of them, but are they are these compacts meant to be available to the public, and also it seems that, at least as I've seen them, that Jan Beagle, there is no compact, or as of yesterday late afternoon, although other undersecretaries general had a 2018 compact, Department of Management did not. Is there a reason for that? I, I think uh, Stefan said all we have had to say about the compacts yesterday. I don't really have anything to add. Yes. Thank you. for. Um, do you have any update about Yemen? Uh, for today, no. We'll we'll try to get further updates as as we get them. You know, we we have been uh, having uh, our concerns, as you know, about uh, humanitarian access, and we'll continue to do that. Meanwhile, Mr. Griffiths continues his work with the parties. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Ron. I did not pick up. Pick up uh, maybe you did say it. Uh, how many Palestinian children are now in Israeli incarcerated by Israel? at this point. Do we have uh, a number on that at all? The information we got from uh, uh, human rights groups who we coordinate with is that as of the end of March, the number was at about 300. Coming up, Brendan.